guys again this morning. And we are going to dive right into our session on the truth about dinosaurs. And I mentioned yesterday that this, in the broader origins debate, is kind of my specialty. You can't specialize on everything. You can't be into chemistry and geology. And so you got to, you, I'm, I'm kind of a generalist. But amongst all this, this is kind of my area of specialty, is the dinosaurs. I've researched it quite a bit. And uh, sometimes people ask, well, how did you get started in this, Dino Dave? What made you start this website? I have a website, Genesis Park, and we started all the way back in 1999, pretty early days of the internet. And uh, we, we established this tagline, dinosaurs, living evidence of a powerful creator. And I truly believe that. I believe that God made these creatures to showcase his power, his glory, and Satan has stolen, hijacked God's dinosaurs. And so part of my mission is to redeem the reptiles, to bring them back for the glory of our great creator. And uh, as I travel, I always mention the Boston Museum of Science, because I kind of give them credit for starting me on this trajectory. When I was... Uh, in high school, we did a field trip to the Boston Museum of Science. And you guys probably have some museums, uh, maybe in the St. Louis area or somewhere around here. I know Chicago's got the Chicago Field Museum. They got some great dinosaurs. But in, uh, in the Boston Museum of Science, we have this triceratops. And I remember as a young man, my first full dinosaur skeleton. I get there, and I'm just in awe. Oh, I'm just looking at this thing and looking at wow, the size of it. And, and so wowed. And then I get looking at this plaque, and the plaque says that this dinosaur lived 60 million years before man evolved. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, now there's the facts, and that is given this baloney here. And I remember getting into a debate with a person at the Boston Museum of Science, one of the people on staff there. So I, 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 as I travel all over the world, I give them credit for starting me off on this trajectory from being a very normal young person to ending up as Dino Dave. Well, there's been a lot of revolutions in our ideas about dinosaurs. Uh, the scientists certainly haven't got the dinosaurs all figured out. You know, every few years they come up with something new. For example, here's Life magazine way back in 1953, and it says this. It's true that dinosaurs grew so vast, so ponderous, they expanded into decadence and doom. Basically got so fat they went extinct, right? Well, that was 1953. Here's 1995. Rethinking the riddle of the dinosaurs. Okay, we've got to rethink it. Here's another one, Time Magazine. The truth about dinosaurs. Surprise, just about everything you believe is wrong. Unfortunately, just about everything in their magazine article is wrong. Uh, here is National Geographic 2015. The big, the bad, the bizarre. After two centuries of paleontological harvest, the evidence seems stranger than any fable. It continues to get stranger. So they're continuing to be surprised, and they're continuing to learn a lot about the dinosaurs. Here's our outline. We're going to talk about why I like to say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator. Then I want to give you some evidence that dinosaurs coexisted with man. You say something like that in paleontological communities, and they look like you got three eyeballs. Like, how can you possibly believe that? Don't we know they all went extinct 60 million years ago? Uh, and then we're going to have some fun in the end. I'll take you on a dinosaur hunting expedition. So that's kind of our our outline. So let's talk about this for just a minute. Why do I have this tagline? Why do I like to say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator? If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. If you don't have your Bibles, I, I do have most of the slides on the overhead, but I'd like you to see this verse because I'm going to ask a couple questions about it. Uh, here we see the prophet Isaiah and he's asking an incredulous question, like how can you not know this. He's asking this of his, his nation, of his people. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, he says, Have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. Now right there, the prophet Isaiah is saying, there are some things that we should understand about God the creator just from looking at the world around about us. I mean, even before we open the Bible, we should just be able to look at the world and understand certain things about God. We call this general revelation, as opposed to specific revelation, which is the Word of God. So just from the world about us, there are three things the prophet says we should be able to ascertain about the Creator. Can you find one in there? There's three. What's something he says that we should be able to learn about God just from looking at creation? Okay, he's everlasting. So whoever made time must himself exist outside of time, right? 
Very good. So that's one. It's God's eternality can be gathered just by looking at the world around about us. What's another? Well, he is the creator, but what can we learn about the creator? He faints not. We've got a kind of theological word for God's great power. What, do we, what is it? Omnipotent, right? So even the greatest of men, the strongest of men, is going to get tired and have to take a nap eventually, right? God never gets tired. He's omnipotent. There's one more. Yeah, there's no searching of his understanding. We got a scientific word for that too. What do we call that? Or a theological word for that too. What do we call that? His omniscience, right? So we can see just from looking at the world round about us, God's eternality, his omnipotence, and his omniscience. Whoever made all this complexity, we talked about it yesterday, the cellular level must be incredibly smart. So we see God's power on display just from general revelation. Well, what part does a large creature like a dinosaur play in this general revelation? I think it's an important part, actually. An impressive creature like this tells about a great creator. I don't think it's an accident that God made these creatures and we're so fascinated by them. Uh, people are grabbed by these creatures, I mean, literally from kids all the way up through to you know, older people like me. We love them, right? They, movie after movie, successful about dinosaurs, and they're all over theme parks and books and magazines and, goodness, even breakfast cereal. Dinosaurs are everywhere. They're impressive. Like all biology, dinosaurs are complex, and that points to God. And there's evidence that some might still exist today. I'm not going to say you're going to get run over by one on Highway 47, but there's some remote areas of the world. The world's a big place. We haven't explored it all yet. It could be there's some of these creatures that are still out there. We'll talk about that more as we go. But the evidence is that they are smaller, smaller than the fossil record. Here's a little sneaky secret. Everything is smaller than it used to be. Things are not evolving. They're de-evolving. Okay? So it's evidence for creation. And then no plausible naturalistic origin. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Fossils just, boom, appear suddenly without precursors leading up to them. And the dinosaurs are a good example of that. His, and a quote from the British Natural History Museum. And they say, dinosaurs are one of the most successful groups of animals that have roamed the planet from small creatures just a few feet long to some of the largest animals ever to have walked the earth. But despite their long <clears throat> evolutionary history, the origin of dinosaurs remains shrouded in mystery. When they first appeared, they were already recognizably dinosaurs. Poof, they just showed up like they were created. Well, of course, they were created, right? But it doesn't stop evolutionists from using dinosaurs to sell evolutionary theory. And they're really good at that. Here's a quote from... Sean Carroll's book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful, he says, dinosaurs are the poster children of evolution. They inspire the vast majority of those who touch them. And unfortunately, I have to admit he's true. They've been very successful at co-opting the dinosaurs to sell kids Darwinian evolution. You can't go to a national park, you can't go to a museum where they have dinosaurs without seeing millions and billions of years ago, long before man evolved, blah, 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 blah. Men and dinosaurs never coexisted. You just get fed this. See, that's just part and parcel of the dinosaurs. How about this? You guys ever heard this one? Don't you know, Dino Dave, that dinosaurs evolved into birds? You're so dumb. When you're eating KFC, you're eating a dinosaur. You ever heard that? Here's what they don't tell you at the museums. Paleontologists have found 432 mammal species in the dinosaur layers, also many modern bird species. Parrots, owls, penguins, ducks, loons, albatross, cormorants, sandpipers, and avocets have all been found right alongside popular dinosaurs. Now follow me for just a minute. If you've got a dinosaur and he's slowly turning into, over millions of years, the first proto-bird, which will then diversify amongst all the various modern birds we have today, then how can you have recognizable modern birds buried right next to the dinosaurs? This doesn't make sense, does it? They don't tell you that. 
How about this one? What killed the dinosaurs? At once, they roamed all over the earth. Literally, you got dinosaur fossils from Antarctica all the way up to Alaska and everywhere in between. So they were, they were all over the place. How come they're not today? What happened? All kinds of theories. Ice age, okay. The flood. Well, we know the flood wiped out everything that wasn't on the ark, right? And the flood made, we'll talk about it more tonight, but the flood made all these beautiful dinosaur fossils that we have. But, of course, crocodiles got wiped out, and we have them running around still, and large lizards got wiped out, and we have them running around still. So they were on the ark, they repopulated afterwards. How come we don't have dinosaurs running all over the place? Yeah, they didn't get along with men real well. This is true. What would the evolutionists say changed it from being this kind of reptilian paradise to it being so rough they couldn't survive? What would they say? The, month, the number one theory is the asteroid, right? Dino Day, there was this huge explosion, fiery meteor came down, and maybe in the Yucatan Peninsula, and poosh, burned up all the reptiles. But here's what they don't tell you about that. Not a majority of paleontologists buy it. In fact, there's about 20 different theories about why the dinosaurs went extinct, and none of them have a majority of paleontologists behind them. They all got problems. For example, the problem with this one, which is the most popular one, if all the dinosaurs got wiped out, how come thin-skinned salamanders survived? And with crocodiles, we talked about them, and they're very, quite similar in physiology to dinosaurs and large monitor lizards. How, how come they survived? So it, there's issues with it. Uh, one of the theories is, you know, the oxygen change. There wasn't enough oxygen, and, you know, Triceratops, his oxygen tank ran out, and that was the end of him. Um, here's a theory. You think they missed the boat. You think they got their calendar wrong, and, oops, oh, man, we missed the boat. No, no, no. God says they were too very kind on the ark, and, and so God had it well in hand. We'll talk about that more in our, in our final session. So it was already mentioned a couple of these things, but as creationists, we would say post-flood environmental changes is a big one. After the flood, we believe there was an ice age, and large reptiles, no, yeah, they don't do so well in cold and snow. Uh, now again, you're going to have some temperate zones along the equator and even along the, uh, the warm oceans, so some, some would have survived. And as the population spread out from Babel, people begin to encounter these great reptiles, and they call them dragons. And people kill dragons. We got lots of reports of that. As Josiah said, you know, they're a threat. People say, okay, we'll deal with it. And sometimes it deals with them, sometimes they deal with it. Uh, but we have lots of reports of people killing dragons, hunting them because they were a threat to men or killed for food or medicine or maybe a desire to be a hero. And then I think some did survive till pretty recent times, and we'll talk about them. So that's our point number one. How about this one? What's some evidence that dinosaurs coexisted with man? Well, let's start with the Bible. That's our ultimate authority, right? Here is National Geographic, and they say this. No human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Biblically, is that statement true? No. Who do we know, on the authority of God's word, absolutely, 100% for sure, saw living dinosaurs? Jonah? Job. Okay, yeah, we're going to get to that one. Good, you guys are running ahead of me here. We'll catch, we'll catch him. Very good. Noah, right? We talked about this. Two of every kind on the ark. Who else? Adam. Adam named all the animals, right? So literally, if you take God's word, which is what we're going to take this morning, and have that explain the, the dinosaurs rather than National Geographic, literally from the very first day that dinosaurs and men existed, they coexisted together on this planet. Because it says, this is day six, same day God made man, God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw it was good. Well, that, the, the creeping things and the beasts of the earth, that's, that's the dinosaurs. Okay, they fit in that category. Well, somebody mentioned Job. We're going to talk about Job. Let me give you kind of a running start on the book of Job. because It's a book that's kind of a little unfamiliar to a lot of folks. And so I just want to give you a little bit of an idea, and there's a point to this. The book of Job starts with a tragedy in Job's life. 
Now somebody says, you know, I've had a bad day, and maybe they think they had a bad day because their hair didn't turn out. Some of us, we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, some people are having a bad day because, you know, you know, they didn't like what they had for breakfast or they couldn't get a cup of coffee, the line was too long at Dunkin' Donuts or whatever. Job had a really bad day. You probably have never had in your life a day as bad as Job had. And one day, God allows Satan to come in, kills all his kids, takes all his wealth. It'd be like a tree lands across your house and takes up both your cars at the same time. I can't believe it. His camels are gone, his oxen are gone, his asses are gone, his, everything just wiped out. And then to make matters worse, God allows Satan to touch his body. He's got boils all over his body. Um, my sister, Kathy Beeman, she's a, she's a missionary in Zambia, Africa. You guys support her. And her youngest, Paul, got one boil on the side of his head and they medevaced him to South Africa because they were afraid he was going to get his brain and boils. Very serious. Job had these boils all over his body. He's miserable. And then to make things worse, his friends show up and they come to comfort him, but they don't comfort him. Actually, they accuse him of being a sinner. Like, you must be really bad, Job. We didn't know it, but you must be a really bad dude for all this stuff happened to you. This guy's miserable. And Job begins to question God. And, and, and he just, and you can read the arguments back and forth amongst them. It's pretty amazing. But in Job chapter 13, Job hits this breaking point of frustration. And you can sympathize with him after all he's been through. He says, surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason with God. And, and he says, God, where are you? I, would you just sit down there so we can have a conversation? What's going on? You ever feel like that? You ever been frustrated with your life? God, what's going on in my marriage? God, what's going on with my work? This is crazy. Why, why do you give me this boss? Maybe, maybe it's just a, a, a financial mess, or maybe it's a physical calamity, and you just are struggling, and you're just under a weight, and you're, God, why do you allow this in my life? This makes no sense, God. What, what are you doing? That's so what Job was just, God, where are you? In all likelihood, God's not going to show up for you to answer the questions in your life. God's not going to come sit across the room and say, all right, Harry, let me tell you what's going on here. But we can learn a lot from God how God begins to interact just with Job. Because God does show up, and he begins to answer Job in chapter 38. Now, here's the weird part. God never answers any of Job's questions. In fact, God begins to ask Job questions. And they're hard ones. God asked about 70 questions. You can add it up sometime. That's what I calculated. But he asked questions like this. Hey, Job, have you ever entered in the springs of the sea? My friends, we didn't know that there were springs in the sea until 1973 with submarines we discovered in the very bottom of these deep ocean trenches, there's these, these, these geysers that shoot up and whole communities of blind cave fish and blind shrimp and stuff are behind these huge springs at the bottom of the ocean. We never knew that until 1973. Job never saw that. And God says, where were you when I founded the world? Have you ever seen the mountain goats give birth? And, and what about this and what about that? And Job's like... Now, why is God doing this? He doesn't answer any of Job's questions. Job can't answer any of God's questions. What's going on with this conversation? Here's the point. God is communicating to Job, I am almighty, all-wise, eternal God. I've got this. You can just trust me. And the takeaway from that for us is this. Our problem is not these issues in our life that we're all upset about. Our problem is our view of Almighty God. When you've got a big view of God, 
Our problems are real small because he's got this. I mean, we just got to trust him. This is nothing. He's got totally got this. But when we lose our view of Almighty God, then we got to figure this out. And this is bad. We got issues, and it's where we get all worked up and turned and spun around and, and contorted and worried and we're anxious. And we got to get the right view of God. We need a fresh view of God's power and greatness and omniscience and omnipotence and just let Him have it. That's our real problem. See? That's the message of Job. And I say all that because then God introduces us to a couple of creatures. In Job chapter 40, we read about this creature called behemoth. What's a behemoth? Well, we don't know 100% for sure, but there's some different theories out there. And uh, the first thing we can learn about is in Job 40 verse 15, it says he eats grass like an ox. He's herbivorous. Could behemoth be a T-Rex? No. How about a tiger? No, these guys are carnivores, right? So that, uh, that just narrows it down a little bit, but you still got a lot of creatures that are herbivorous. And then it says in verse 16, he has his force in his navel, and the strength of his belly, he's got his big, strong belly. And because of verse 16, some commentators suspect and theorize that perhaps it was an elephant. Of course, elephants have big, strong bellies. And so you might have a commentator in the edge of your Bible that says maybe Behemoth was an elephant. Others say, no, 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 we prefer the hippo, and so you have some commentators that come down on the side of the hippo, and maybe your Bible might say in the marginal notes, perhaps behemoth is a, is a hippo. Uh, both of those ideas have a problem. Uh, I think that there's another candidate that needs to be considered, and that's these big sauropod dinosaurs, because they have a big belly as well. But here's the kicker. It says in verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar tree. Now, the cedar trees are the biggest and tallest trees in the Middle East. They use them for masts on boats. They use them to make Solomon's temple. And so this is a prominent tree that stands above the rest of the trees. And if you're going to point that out as a significant feature of this creature, well, you ought to have a tail to back it up, right? Have you ever seen the tail of an elephant? Well, let's spin around this nice little elephant, and oh my, no. That's not a tail like a cedar tree. How about our friend the hippopotamus? Notice this nice little hippo. We'll spin him around and, oh, wow. <laughs> like, not even, right? Maybe a twig. How about our friend the sauropod dinosaur? Yeah, one of the major features of these creatures is the tail. A tail like anything, nothing else. And if you were going to say, hey, let me describe this creature in some predominant characteristics, you probably would pick out either the neck or tail. So I think much more likely, pretty sure, this is a sauropod dinosaur still a time, alive at the time of Job. Job is the oldest book in the Bible, and very likely he knew of these creatures, these sauropod dinosaurs. Verse 19 kind of clinches it for me. It says he's the chief of the ways of God. He's the biggest thing that God made to walk around on the earth. Remember, the whole point of the book of Job is God showing his power and greatness to Job. So he's pointing to the biggest thing he made. Then God shifts gears, and he points to the fiercest thing he made, and he begins to talk about another dinosaurian. Well, these things weighed 100 tons, equivalent of 14 school buses. But in 41, he talks about a creature named Leviathan. What's Leviathan? Honestly, don't know. But it's fierce. And probably a dinosaurian creature. And God has a little bit of sense of humor and says, hey, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Let's say Josiah and I are going fishing, okay? Josiah's in the boat with me, and he gets a big old worm on there, and he kind of throws it out there into the, into the waters, and all of a sudden, boom, he's got one. I said, oh, wait, Josiah, bring it in. And he pulls it up, and it's a dinosaur. Do you want to bring it in the boat? Probably not. In fact, when that thing rears up, we're probably both going to be swimming for sure, and it's a question of who's going to swim faster, Josiah or me. And God has a sense of humor and says, you know, do you want to catch one of these things? Now, verse 10 is kind of the point of the whole story. None is so fierce that would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? If you saw one of these great dinosaurs, you would be scared to death. 
And yet we live our life oblivious to the point that we're going to stand before God. Far more dreadful and far more fearful. The very creator of the dinosaurs. Well, the Leviathan is a fire-breathing dinosaur, it says there. It says his sparks of fire come out of his mouth and, and he breathes fire. So, Dave, you believe in fire-breathing dragons? I do. Mostly because the Bible says so. But also there's some good historical evidence. There's a number of ancient cultures. As far as we know, they didn't interact, but they all have stories of fire-breathing dragons. How come one didn't pick the fire-breathing mosquito or the fire-breathing duck? They all picked the dragon. What's with that? No, I think there really were fire-breathing dragons. We have some biological evidence. Anybody heard of the bombardier beetle? How many have heard of this character? Okay, a bunch of you guys have. So the bombardier beetle is kind of a fire, not so much breathing, but a fire-emitting beetle. <laughs> It comes out his abdomen, right? But he has this hydrogen quinine and hydrogen peroxide, combines the two of them, and pshh, there's this explosion, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And wow, he's got a little squirt gun. He can shoot it underneath him without burning himself. He can shoot it over his back. He can squirt it around this way and that way. It's a fire-breathing beetle. Uh, not too long ago, uh, a boy was out, and one of these landed on his neck, and he thought it was a bug, and he went to slap it, and he got a beetle burn. You know, these things are pretty nasty. Fire, little guys, but fire-breathing beetles. So biologically, it's possible. And maybe there was some dinosaur that had this head crest, and up in their head crest, they had the chemicals, and they could kind of breathe it out through. Uh, we don't know. It's just a theory. It's just a possibility. And then we have uh, some other creatures, uh, reptilian-type flying forms mentioned in Isaiah 14, 29, and 36. Could be uh, pterodactyl-type creatures as well. So that's dinosaurs in the Bible. Now, I'm going to put it into high gear. You thought I talked fast. We're going to move really quick here. I got lots of these in my book. And so I'll just give you a few. Here is some artwork that ancient peoples did in Havasu. I'm sorry, yeah, this is a Natural Bridges National Monument uh, of a long neck, long tail creature. The Native Americans did this. Here we have the Combro figurines from Mexico, ceramics. And they look a lot like dinosaurs. We have uh, the Ica stones, and I have a sample of an Ica stone here this morning. You can come take a look at this afterwards. But there's these blackened uh, river rocks, andesite rocks from uh, Peru, and they carve what appear to be dinosaurian creatures on these things. Uh, interestingly enough, they have these little rounded tubercules, uh, which are much like some of the very rare fossilized skin. You see the same little rounded tubercules on it. Uh, here is some pottery. You see a dinosaurian creature on that. Here you see some mochi burial artifacts and these long neck, long tail creatures. They call them strombus monsters. In Cambodia, we have a temple with all this jungle grown up all around it, ancient Khmer culture, and they have all these pillars, and these pillars are ornate. They got cows, and they have uh, bulls, and uh, horses, and water buffalo. But what's that? Looks a lot like a stegosaurus that was known by the ancient Khmer civilization. Here we have from Mesopotamia these cylinder seals that roll these seals out, kind of like uh, making an impression in wax uh, to seal an object. But these long neck creatures uh, that uh, here you see some more of them, a couple of them fighting over a sheep, uh, but they appear to be dinosaurs. Here on the walls of ancient Babylon from 600 BC, dragons with scales and forked tongues, people drawing pictures of dinosaur and creatures. Here is an urn from ancient uh, Akaria, which is modern-day Turkey, but you see what appears to be a Mosasaurus on the urn. Here is a mosaic. Mosaic, lots of little stones. And this is uh, from England, from the Roman times, 200 to 400 AD, well before we're digging up any dinosaurs, much less plesiosaurs. And yet we have what appear to be creatures, ocean creatures. You see fish in the background, and they have flippers. And it's something like a plesiosaur. Look at the long necks on these things. How did they know what a plesiosaur looked like, okay? They weren't digging these things up, and yet they were able to do these drawings of them. Here's the world's most famous mosaic called the Palestrina Mosaic, just south of Rome. I went there and took this picture. You can look online, Google the Palestrina Mosaic. They're going to show you all the beautiful hippos and elephants and everything. They will never show you this, because uh, <laughs> here you have some black-skinned African warriors, probably from Ethiopia, and they are fighting what would appear to be a dinosaur on the mosaic. 
Lots of dragon reports from China. Of course, we have the 12 signs of the zodiac. We all admit that these other 11 are real animals. So what about the dragon? Why would they put one mythical animal? No, I believe they knew dragons. And they have this dragon in their mosaic. In 1611, they had the royal dragon feeder, a post. And uh, the emperor, of course, used dragons to pull his chariot. Uh, the interpretation of dinosaurs as dragons goes back more than 2,000 years in Chinese culture. They were regarded as sacred symbols of power. Here is a dragon I was able to buy on the antiquities market. It looks, an, it's a Chinese artifact uh, from the Tang Dynasty, it looks a lot like an overraptor. Here's another one I was able to purchase from Hong Kong, get it shipped to me, and it uh, wasn't cheap, but this is from 1766 to 1122 BC, thousands of years old. Look how similar it is to a Sarolophus dinosaur, a jade carving. And so the Chinese have all these different carvings of dragons. Also a lot of dragons from medieval Europe. A guy named a name of Ulysses Aldrovandus on your left there, very highly regarded by secular historians. Some people call him the father of natural history. He worked at the first university in the world in Bologna, Italy. He established the first museum in the world. And he had a dragon that was given to him that he accepted into his collection. And this dragon, you see a picture of it, had just two legs. But he tells the story of this farmer Batista, who runs into this dragon, clunks it on the head, kills it, brings it to the museum. He records the date, the time, all the details about this thing. And uh, Beowulf, the story of Beowulf from medieval uh, Europe, killing dragons. Uh, St. George, lots of different paintings of this event of St. George killing a dragon about 1450 AD. Now, I'm not saying every one of these is gospel truth. But there's so many of them, and a lot of them give very specific details that kind of match up, and I think that some of them are real. At least some of these ones are real. And we have lots of carvings on these beautiful castles. Look at this carving of a dragon. Here's another one. It doesn't look like a lizard. Uh, it walks very upright, and look at these claws, and look at the big scales on this thing. Looks more like maybe a Komodo dragon or a dinosaur. Look what's coming out of his mouth. What's he breathing? He's breathing fire. Look at the similarities between that and a baryonyx dinosaur. Quite close. Here's one more you see him breathing fire there. But walking erect, not like lizards where they drag their bellies or crocodiles. Uh, here you see a tapestry and you see a mama dinosaur. And you look over in the bushes, you see her looking back at her baby. So people are doing these drawings, they're doing these carvings, they're doing these tapestries. All this artwork about dragons. Here's a pterosaur on ancient tapestry in France from 1514. We didn't start digging up pterosaurs till the 1700s, 1800s. Here's a dragon. Uh, I took this picture at the Church of San Miniato in Florence, Italy. Um, beautiful painting of a pterosaur. Uh, there was a pterosaur that lived in a cave in Rome in 1691. And uh, they killed it and they mounted it and put it on this, well, it's since disintegrated, but they did a woodcut of the thing, and the woodcut survived, and it looks an awful lot like a ramp for rinked pterosaur, something like one of these guys here with the long tail. And so uh, quite likely they were known in that time. Even up to just about the turn of the century, 1890, this is after the Civil War in this country, in Arizona, the newspaper reports some cowboys shot down and killed a winged dragon. Maybe they killed the last Thunderbird. The Indians talk about the Thunderbird. Don't know. But they brought the wing back to town and the newspaper ran with the story. So we've got reports from all over the world, people interacting with dragons. Okay. Uh, let me real quick give you a little bit of fossil analysis. There's some good evidence from the fossils themselves. They just didn't last millions of years. These are recent. Um, there's Footprints down in Texas. I've been down there three times now, done excavations down there in the Paluxy River area. Some of them are pretty nebulous, like this one down in the riverbed is kind of washed out, but some of them are pretty good. Here is a footprint called the Willet Track that was excavated right there in the state park. Uh, and you look at it like, what kind of dinosaur left that footprint? No, it looks like a human was walking in these same rock layers where all these dinosaur footprints are. They made it a state park because there's all these dinosaur footprints, but we have some human footprints as well. Here's the best one. This is called the Elvis Delk track. And this is a footprint where the dinosaur stepped on top of the human footprint. And again, this is back when it was soft mud, then it hardens to rock. And, and, and this has been CAT scan authenticated. 
Uh, so some humans and dinosaurs are running around, and they're probably running away from the flood. They're not worried about each other. They're worried about getting away from a global flood that's leaving all these layers and then fossilizing the tracks in behind them. Well, the bones themselves, there's evidence, just are not millions of years old. Sometimes, mostly these bones are turned to rock, but sometimes when they break them open, they're still soft, gooey tissue inside these things. And in 2000 and, uh, uh, sorry, 1997, it came to light that they had hemoglobin, blood cells, unfossilized dinosaur tissue. Uh, and here's some pictures of this under microscope. And still soft, gooey tissue in a T-Rex bone that was recovered from Montana. Pliable tissue, not millions of years old. And then for the first time in 2020, just a couple years ago, we were able to extract dinosaur DNA. Now, DNA is a very fragile molecule, more so even than hemoglobin and osteocytes and some of these other ones. There's just no way it could last even 100,000 years, much less millions of years. And yet here's a picture of it under microscope. You can see the cell nucleus, the DNA, and even one of the cells is dividing there within this unfossilized dinosaur bones. Uh, labs have carbon-14 dated dinosaur bones, and uh, in 2012, researchers analyzed a whole bunch of dinosaurs from across the western U.S., and they dated for less than 39,000 years. Now, I think some of these radiometric dates are exaggerated. We'll talk about that more in our next session. But at the very least, they're not 100,000 years old, less than 39,000 years old. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. Let's have a little bit of fun. Let's take you on some dinosaur hunting expeditions. So there's an area of research called cryptozoology. What on earth is cryptozoology? Well, it's a study of hidden animals, crypto hidden zoology animals. And it's studying animals that have not yet been proved to exist. For example, we talked yesterday about this little fishy fella. Anybody remember what's the name of that fish? Coelacanth, right? It's supposed to be extinct for millions of years, and ba-boom, somebody catches one. How about this fellow on the right, the bashful-looking guy, looks like a half zebra, half uh, giraffe. Anybody know what's that? Can't think of the name. Can anybody think of the name? An okapi. When the Africans from Central Africa, Equatorial Africa, began to tell the Westerners about this, the British were very skeptical. A creature that's striped like a zebra and has a long neck like a giraffe, you guys have been smoking too much of that weed stuff that you guys do, right? Oh, no, 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 we have these creatures. They're very rare. Eventually, they produced a hide of one of these things, and so the British got serious about it. They went off, and sure enough, they got a baby one. Unfortunately, it didn't survive, uh, but then eventually they got some adults, and they're very rare. The okapi was proven to exist. The Africans know what they're talking about. They live there, right? This is the same area where they talk about there being a dinosaur, some of these great reptiles still alive. So could it be that there's some plesiosaurs maybe in the deep ocean trenches or in some deep lakes? Or could it be that there's actually some dinosaurs still walking around? Or could it be that there are actually some of these flying pterosaurs that are still walking around? I want to give you a few of the candidates that I think are at least possibilities out there today. We have a lake up on the border of Vermont and New York called Lake Champlain. It goes out uh, through the St. Lawrence Seaway to the ocean, and so it has access to the Atlantic Ocean. And there have been a number of sightings in this lake of a creature they call champ. Champ. This goes all the way back to, uh, uh, to uh, Samuel de Champlain, who the lake is named after. He saw this creature. But then there have been a lot of reports, including this photograph by Sandra Mancy in the late 70s. Uh, there have been some video footage even the last couple of years of this creature. I've been there a number of times. I've yet to see anything, but I talk to people, some who don't like to talk to the media because they don't want to be made fun of, but they say, yeah, we've seen this creature. Now, you might be familiar with Loch Ness Monster. I've been to Loch Ness. I'm a little bit skeptical. There are no real great photos of this creature. I think they've done a nice job marketing it, but maybe there was once something. I'm not so sure it's still alive today. The best we've got is this a sonar image that was taken by Robert Rines, and uh, here I am with uh, Dr. Rines, and so he, uh, he's a Nessie researcher, since passed away, but there I am at 
Loch Ness. Very interesting area, very dark water, and uh, supposedly there are these sonar blips that continue to get, and people say it's a plesiosaur. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, Okanagan, I think, is a better candidate than uh, Loch Ness. Lake Okanagan is up in British Columbia, a very long, very deep lake, uh, 79 miles long, 800 feet deep uh, glacial lake, and there's a creature called Ogopogo that supposedly lives in this lake. Now, it's not a plesiosaur, it's more of a sea serpent type of thing. It's kind of got these humps, and you'll see these humps come up out of the water. Sometimes you see the head or tail, but mostly you just see these humps, and there been lots of sightings of this thing. So I went up there with my buddy Bill Gibbons, and we spent a week there, and here we rented a boat, and we were going around, and we saw something. I can't say absolutely for sure what it was, but we saw the bumps come up out of the water. My whole family was there, and I'm yelling to my wife, turn on the video camera. She's yelling to my daughter, get your hands out of the water. I'm saying, who cares about my daughter's hand? We'll get her a prosthetic limb or something. It's okay, turn the video camera on. Man, my wife's priorities, you know? So by the time we got the video camera all going, we just got a picture of the wake. Now, honestly, I never saw much that would have been convincing anyway, but we all saw like these humps come out and then just take off at a high rate of speed and left this huge wake behind. Now, what was it? I can't tell you for sure, but it was big. I mean, there weren't any boats in the area and you see that huge wake. Okay, the Ropin. This one I, I really feel good about. I'm kind of moving up the chain of, of likelihood here. This one I feel really good about. In Papua New Guinea, they talk about a nocturnal flying creature that has long tail, beak, teeth in the beak, and they call it the Ropen, R-O-P-E-N. I got to go there to Papua New Guinea to these little islands that you see, Umba Island. We uh, talked to a lot of people. Based on the reports, we feel it looks something like this, has the bumps go down the back, a little bit of a head crest, and uh, talked to a lot of different people. We stayed up all night, had night vision equipment, uh, had tasers in case this thing came down. And one night I actually saw this thing, a very large thing flying parallel in the valley between me and the other, other mountains. I couldn't see it clear enough to see you know, exactly what it was, but it wasn't your average owl or bat, I'll tell you that. These things are large, have like a 10 foot wingspan, they are huge. And uh, I've been there now multiple times to Papua New Guinea, and uh, we have hopes of maybe going back with some net guns. Um, Last of all, I want to talk about the Mokele Membe. This one's cool. Hoping to go back in January 2024, a year and a month from now. On the border of Cameroon and Congo, the pygmies talk about the Mokele and Bembe. What's the Mokele and Bembe? Well, they will draw you pictures very clearly of a long-necked, long-tailed creature like this. You see, how big is it? They'll say, well, it's about between an elephant and a hippo. And these reports go way back. Uh, the Smithsonian sent an expedition to Congo uh, the University of Chicago under Roy Mackle. He made multiple trips there looking for this thing. Uh, there's been a lot of trips. Congo was tough to get to because of civil war, but around 2000, Bill Gibbons and I became aware of reports of this creature, not just in the swamps of Congo, where there'd been traditional research uh, and even carvings, people carved this thing, but we became aware of reports in Cameroon. And notice lower right, Congo and Cameroon have a border. Creatures don't care about the border, they're swimming back and forth, the swamps go back and forth, the rivers go back and forth. And so we traveled to uh, Douala and Yoende, we rented a, a four wheel, went up to Bertua, then we get on the logging roads down to Yakuduma, and then hiked our way down and floated our way down to Malundu, and then came back. And here's a couple little pictures of this expedition that we did. And here you see Bill Gibbons and me and our guide, Pierre, and uh, we're getting ready to go off into the bush. Here we are filling up at a jungle gas station. How about that, huh? Filling up at a jungle gas station. You see the dirt roads, these are logging roads, and then we begin to come across the pygmy peoples. Look at these kids, bloated bellies from malnutrition, rags for clothes. I felt so sorry for these precious kids that we'd run across. And uh, in Cameroon, you've got the, the, the villagers, they're Bantu tribes, they're tall, some of them taller than us. But then you also got the pygmies, and the pygmies are quite short. They're forest people, kind of like the American Indians. They're living, subsistence living in the forests, uh, what they can gather, fruit and animals. And so here you see the pygmies. Look, they hardly come up to my shoulders. And they have their bark uh, walls and their thatched roofs. And we hired some of these guys with their spears to take us into the jungle. And these guys are impressive. They're carrying our backpacks, 
they're cutting the, the path ahead with their uh, machetes, they got spears, and we can still barely keep up with them. They are hardy people, amazing people. We went into the rainforest, it rains every single day. Uh, you get a little bit of sunshine, and then the rain comes up. It's a lot of really weird trees, big trees, prickly trees. Uh, you learn not to touch things. <laughs> uh, and, and we're just slogging, we're hiking our way through. Here you can just see, just hacking through the vegetation and a little sunshine, and then it rains on you. You're always wet, you're stinking, there's no showers. This is not a glamorous vacation. Lots of bugs. You never get away from the bugs. There's just bugs everywhere. And uh, you get foot rot from you know, just your feet being wet all the time. And eventually we came to this place called the Bumba River. And the Baca pygmies say, that's where we see the creature, Dino Dave. It's right there in this area. So we had brought this inflatable raft, we pumped it up, and here you see me rafting down the Bumba River. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Dino Dave, what about the crocodiles and the hippos and the Mokele Membe? We prayed a lot. And there we were floating down the river, and we would stop at these different villages along the way and interview people, and they would say, yeah, we know this creature, they'll draw it out for you, they'll tell you how big it is. These people had never seen someone with white skin before. No one had been telling them stories about dinosaurs or anything. They're just giving you the facts. And one of the things that these eyewitnesses kept saying over and over again is the creature fights with its tail. It whips hippos, whips elephants, and keeps them out of its section of the river. And I heard this multiple times and kind of stuck in my brain. Here you see a dugout canoe, bananas. We ate a lot of bananas. Finally got to Malundu. That's where the ferry takes the logging equipment across the river there. That's the bottom. On the other side is the Congo. Well, we got back. I wrote this up. The BBC sent a trip to follow up to Cameroon. There's been other trips that have gone. A French fellow's gone. They got pictures now of nests of these creatures. They got pictures of footprints. There's a Mokele Mebi footprint. Uh, we have not yet gotten a good fi uh, picture or video of the creatures. But I want to wrap up by getting back to God's Word for just a minute. I came back from the Congo, and I was reading the book of the Revelation, and I read this. Behold, a great red dragon, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Question, what is the offensive weapon of the dragon? The tail. I never really noticed that until after I got back from Cameroon. And then I began to study out this matter of the tail of the dragon. Remember Job? It says he moves his tail like a big cedar tree. Boom, boom, like a club. And I began to study it out, and lo and behold, in the medieval times when they knew dragons, in the 1500s, a book says of the dragon, its strength lies not in its teeth, but in its tail. It kills with a blow rather than a bite. Whoa, people that knew dragons kind of say the same thing. And even some modern paleontologists have theorized that diplodocids could have used their tails like a bullwhip, achieving supersonic cracks to intimidate their enemies. Well, the paleontologists are finally catching up to what the people in medieval times and the pygmies and the Bible have been saying all along. You just read your Bible, you're ahead of the times. The Bible's more updated than tomorrow's newspapers. My friend, the Bible... It's God's Word. Well, you got my book, Chronicles of Dinosaurs. It's got a lot more information on it. Go out to my website, genesispark.com. Uh, Dino Dave responds to all emails, so I'll be happy to hear from you. But perhaps you can see why I like to say dinosaurs are living evidence of a powerful creator. Okay, we're a little over time, so let's get dismissed. We'll regather in 10 minutes for our morning service. Thank you very much.